In a previous video, I explained how to model fluids using grid-based methods. Um, Lucas has, has left out comment suggesting that I should just go further in, into explaining how fluids are modeled using computers. So today, I'm going to explain how we use another method, which is instead of considering a grid for representing the fluid, we will use particles and it's called SPH, which stands for Smooth Particles Hydrodynamics. And here it is. So how do we model a fluid? We all know that um, our fluids are basically made of particles, basically molecules that are also made of atoms. But the problem is those particles are too small to, to be used in a computer, at least if you want to model a sizable, uh, size of, uh, sizable part of a fluid. Um, also, you don't need those to model it. So, so there can be some approximations made. Here is basically a representation of a fluid full of particles. This blue circle represents the full fluid and the red dots the atoms of the particles of the fluid. But we don't have enough resolution, enough power on our computers to model it. So we need to use uh, different resources. So in the late 80s, um, Lucy Gingol and Monaghan uh, decided to model it by reducing the number of particles. And by reducing the number of particles, it, it made it more accessible to the computers back then. So instead of having all the particles you see before, we have less. In this case, the red dots represent the computer particles and the arrows, the velocities. Um, so, but what does this mean? It means that if we have a bunch of fluid atoms, like we can see it here, that are represented like fluid particles, we will substitute them by an SPH, a computer particle. And to that SPH, because we need, we still need to see that the fluid is some continuum variable, it's not just a, a full set of different small balls. You see water, you don't see the, the different particles. So we need a way of smoothing it. And mm, to do that, we use this uh, quantity called uh, the smoothing length that is normally represented by H and we need to choose a kernel. And don't worry about the names, that what it does is just scatter around or gather around, depending on the interpretation you use, the mass of the SPH particle, the green particle in the center, um, in a bell form, just to be more precise. Uh, the addition of many different bell-shaped curves will give us the continuum aspect of the uh, simulated fluid. So here is um, our version of um, SPH code. So again, the red dots are the particles, and then the, the arrows are the velocities, and the blue circles represent the smoothing length and the kernel. You can see that the size of the circle is not the same. Uh, it actually it's a proxy for the density of the fluid. So if you have a um, if you have many particles around a certain area, uh, you the, the smoothing length. The, the, the radius of this circle is going to be smaller. Smaller radius, it means like a lot of density in that part. Larger ra radius, it means like little density. So in this case, we have an SPH particle that is going to be moving upwards. And because it moves to a less dense area, it changes its smoothing length. And this is all calculated on the, on the flight. The main issue with SPH codes is, um, at least initially, it, it was that uh, there is nothing that prevents two particles to occupy the same place in, in space, like these two here, that they will, they will travel together, they get the smoothing lengths get smaller and smaller and smaller, and in the end collide. Uh, this is solved by, uh, by adding an ad artificial viscosity, which is a, is a quantity that normally depends on the velocity of the particles that are getting um, closer, the signal velocity actually, uh, but it's, it's solved and, and now it works more or less okay, unless you want to do something very special with your hydro code. In that cases, in cases where the artificial viscosity fails, it's better to rely on the other kind of codes 
that we visited in the previous previous episode. And so far, this is general, but because I'm uh, modeling star formation, I'm going to just use a few more cartoons to explain how I model star formation. So imagine that you have three particles that are just getting together. This will cause their uh, density to become really, really small, um, and that it makes problems when when you are solving the equations. So what um, Bait, Matthew Bait from Exeter, um, uh, figure out in 1995 is to create a sink or a star particle. It's called sink. If these three particles are just traveling uh, in, in, are just going to collide and they are gravitationally bound, that means that they are not escaping the potential well of themselves. In the end, we can substitute them by a star particle, as you can see here, and they, or a sink particle. And they are called sinks because they have the ability to accrete more gas particles. Like this one is being trapped by the gravity of the star, and then it just being eaten up by the sink, and the sink increases its mass. This allows us to do like incredible things in simulation. So let me show you um, a few. So with SPA2 you can do plenty of stuff from just modeling like um, the wind tunnel simulations for cars or or things like that. But I'm interested in the star formation. So here is a molecular cloud, and in this molecular cloud, I uh, the blue dots represent the same particles, and you can see how these blue dots are emitting winds that disperse totally the cloud. So these are a few things that what can be done by ESPH. And that's all for today. Thank you very much, Lucas, for your comment. Please suggest topics. It makes my life easier. And follow me on YouTube, Twitter, or Facebook. And see you guys next week. Bye-bye.